Hey everyone, today I use 1879 Prospector from 345 Subco and I talk about Soapy Smith, the con man of the Klondike. Stay tuned. John Bonham here, Cape Cod Wet Shaving, History Shave Time. Got a good one for you, by request. Today's soap is going to be 1879 Prospector from 345 Soap Co. Um, the History Shave topic today is going to be about a man named Soapy Smith. Um, I call it the con man of the Klondike. He's also known as King of the Frontier Con Men. Pretty cool. Um, let's see if I can fill all this into the video title. We'll see. So... I'll be using the matching shave splash, shave splash, after shave splash with that uh, pre-shave oil. I'm using my Rebels Refinery pre-shave oil and beard oil. Very lightly scented, very pleasant, sweet, goes well with this. And I'm also going to be using the post-shave balm. All right, full set here. Uh, brush I'm going to be using. I don't know what, to, I'm, I always na name the brushes in the video and then I completely forget what the name is later. So for now, I'm calling this the Klondike. It fits very well with the shape. I already got my lather here too, by the way. And the razor I'm going to be using, uh, his Instagram name is at Jill Let's Shave, I believe. I'll have to go back and check. But he posted his Gem Micromatic, and I said the next shave that I do, which was like three shaves ago, I'm going to use mine. But here we are. I'm going to use it. Got my Gem Blade in there. Already palm stropped. And I always laugh to myself with the palm strop thing because when I found out what palm stropping was, I went and looked up a palm strop on Google. Couldn't find one coincidentally until I learned that you actually use your palm as opposed to like a little, you know, itty bitty strop. Anywho, um, let's go ahead. I got my pre-shave oil on. Like I said, I have the lather going, I'm ready to go. Sitting here blooming a little bit, getting fluffy. Um, John Patton has a wonderful base. Um, I'm part of his VIP group, his subscription group, which is a different base, which is phenomenal. But both his bases are very good. Let me show you what I got here. Whip it up a little bit. But this scent is just really, really, really good. It's uh, bourbon, tobacco, leather, and tonka bean. It's actually pretty heavier with the leather. And I still like it. So, like I say, if you blend something that I don't like together, like lavender, it, it's it makes for a really good scent. So, well done, John. Um, okay, so you saw the cover. That's a guy named Soapy Smith. I'm going to go ahead and get this lather on my face and start shaving. And off we go. Uh, by the way, this was, I mentioned Soapy Smith in my Texas Jack for a Million video. And my buddy Dustin, how you doing, man? reminded me that I had said I wanted to do a video on him and I completely forgot and he said hey can you do a video on this guy I've never heard of him I was like absolutely thanks for jogging my memory my buddy Bradley got me a good video topic I gotta do too I'm getting ahead of, ahead of myself so Soapy Smith was born Jefferson Randolph Soapy Smith II November 2nd 1860 in Coweta County Georgia oh I should have used Devil went down to Georgia for my Instagram post. I forgot he was born in Georgia. That's all right. Looking for a soul to steal, something about gold. He's in a bind with him. Anyway, I don't want to get flagged. Um, sorry, that's the way my mind works. <laughs> all right, one sentence into it, and I'm already distracted. All right. Um, he was actually born into a wealthy family, which I didn't know this. Okay. Go figure. It's like some of the douchebags I went to high school with. They were in very nice, well-to-do families, and they still rebelled and were little punks. Just the way it is. Born in a wealthy family, his grandfather actually owned a plantation and was a Georgia politician. Okay, his father was a prominent lawyer. Um, however, after the Civil War, the family found themselves broke, as very many Southerners did. I believe it was called getting Shermaned. What, it, what happened was these people would be rich before the secession of the state. The state would secede, 
and then they were issued Confederate money for the Confederate states. And then, of course, the war is over. That money is barely used as fire starter, you know, worth the uh, worth being used as fire starter. So in the immediate aftermath of the war, they were broke. It's the way it went for a lot of families. Them included. So um, family decided to move to Round Rock, Texas in 1876 for a new start. Okay. I don't know where Round Rock is. I looked it up, but I already forgot. Um, Texas is a big state. It was the biggest in the Union until Alaska. <sighs> Go figure. Doesn't count. No offense, Alaska people. I'm just kidding. Um, it was in Round Rock at the age of 16 that Soapy began his lifelong career as a con artist. In this case, it was as a confidence man. This is about the fifth use of this blade, this gym blade. These blades last a long time. I'm gonna, I'm purposely pushing to see how far I can take this one. I've heard up to 10 uses, which in my case it probably will because my beard's not especially overly thick. So a confidence man is a guy, they still exist today by the way. If you see dominoes or betting on the street with let's say dominoes or the shell game find the ball that kind of thing that's a confidence it's a confidence man running it so what a confidence man does is he gets he earns your trust and he'll say look look at this guy oh he found the ball he just won 20 bucks then he'll do another guy that guy won 10 bucks now what about you you want to try of course you know you're seeing people around you win and then boom you lose that's a confidence man and the term shill which we throw around like very many phrases we throw around all too often an actual shill was a person planted in the audience to win okay those are quotations by the way but that's what a confidence man was so his mother died in 1877 and he decided to leave in 1878 after actually seeing the death of none other than sam bass in july of that year okay i'm 13 year old I think he's playing with my son. Um, Sam Bass uh, perpetrated what is still today the largest and most lucrative train robbery in the history, history of the United States. There's a quick photo of Sam Bass. Well, photo, I, I say. That's a drawing. I believe that was on the wanted poster. But he actually saw a shootout with lawmen of Sam Bass. Give me one second. All right. Reminded of a certain someone that I'm up here. I was just like, hey, dude, remember when I told you about 15 minutes ago I'm doing a video? Well, coincidentally, I'm doing a video. Oh, sorry, Dad. I'm like, that's all right. And my daughter's like, well, I told him you were doing one. And he goes, no, you didn't. She goes, yes, I did. And I was like, this is when I take my leave because then I'm going to start yelling. Kids, all right. So that was Sam Bass. So he moved to Fort Worth, Texas, which I do know where that is, obviously. Been to Fort Worth, Fort, Worth, Fort Worth a few times. In fact, we call it the Dallas Fort Worth area because it's basically a giant outskirt of the city of Dallas. DFW, Dallas Fort Worth, which Lynn at Murphy and McNeil so eloquently reminded me, and I was kicking myself hard that I forgot that, and that abbreviation DFW. I'm like, the factory outlet? She goes, no, that's VFW. I went, oh. Anywho, um, he moved to Fort Worth, Texas, and immediately formed a gang of thieves and miscreants. He eventually became a crime boss of what would be known as the Soap Gang. Okay? There's one of many photos of Soapy with his gang. That was one of the, his first gangs. So he actually made three what you would call enterprises, uh, empires, in his career. Two major gold rushes during both really the major gold rushes, which is the California gold rush and the Klondike gold rush. Um, hence the name of this gold rush of 1879. And the one in the Klondike was 1897, I believe. I think it's on here actually. 1898. Okay, 
So, how's a good photo? They went from town to town performing short cons, such as the shell game, three card Monty, and rigged poker, I would assume Texas Hold'em. For those who don't know, there's five card draw, which is what you see with, you know, everyone sitting around with their cards. There's Texas Hold'em, which is actually my favorite version of poker, where everyone shares two cards on the table. So there's two, two cards on, or there's cards on the table that everyone shares. And it's just way different. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting, I'm veering all over the road here in this video. Um, among the shills of Assistant Smith were, lo and behold, Texas Jack Vermillion and a man named Big Ed Burns, Edward Burns. They called him Edward Big Ed. I'm assuming he was a big guy who would also later clash with none other than the Earps, okay? They think that he was possibly involved with the murder of Morgan. So he was, he didn't happen to know the Cowboys. He was part of the, the Earp stuff that happened later on. So it's so weird. Let me point out too, that Texas Jack and Big Ed worked together Yet Big Ed would assist with attempting the downfalls of the Earps, while Texas Jack would go on and become a friend of the Earps. Isn't that weird? How you could just, on a dime, switch. And remember, Texas Jack didn't know Wyatt Earp. He was a friend of Doc Holliday. And it's Holliday that suggested they get Texas Jack, and it was during the uh, Battle at Iron Springs that Wyatt Earp and Texas Jack got close, but we're not talking about Texas Jack. We're talking about this guy. All right, so Smith arrived in Denver, Colorado in 1879. It was here that he became famous for his prize soap con, which would become his signature. He would become known for this. Look at his name. And for earning his moniker, Soapy. So he was arrested. And I didn't write the name of the officer down. His name was John. He wrote Soapy in his logbook for who he arrested because he couldn't remember his name. And due to that, he would carry the name for life. I don't think he was a big fan of it. I don't know. I don't think I would be. But the world would know him as Soapy Smith after that. All right. And da, da, da. making good time. All right, I gotta keep up. Mario, I got three pages here, so gotta move, move, move. There we go. Uh, the prize soap con involving wrapping a bill around a bar of soap, bar of soap, and hiding it in a large stack of bars. Okay, each soap cost a dollar. So he'd wrap the bill around the bar and then wrap paper around the bar as well to hide where the bill was. So each soap cost a dollar and gave onlookers a chance to win the large bill. Usually it was a $100 bill. So he would just have this, this little podium with a bend in it, and he would stack bars in it, and he would demonstrate, make this big demonstration. Here's this $100 bill. I'm wrapping around the soap. Buy this soap for a dollar. Quite really basically the golden ticket for Wonka. Buy the candy bar, maybe the ticket's inside. That's literally what the point was. So what he would do, and I think it was famous because no one had really done this, but to be honest, you could do it with anything. Chocolate, I think, was still considered a rich delicacy back then. So it wasn't readily available, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong. Because they're still bringing it up from South America, so it was still expensive. Um... You could do it, you know, with anything. You could do it with, you know, a pouch of tobacco. You could do it with, you know, a sack of flour. Because flour was in canvas. You could, you know, something like that. You could cut it open, put it in, sew it back shut. Um, so what would happen was a shill would buy the winning bar. And after making a big shill, oh my gosh, look, everybody, I won the hundred. And it came out of that stack. And he would use sleight of hand and things like that. To either keep it himself or the shill would get it. Uh, the frenzied crowd would then buy the rest of the soap. Lo and behold, no one else would win. Here's a drawing of Soapy hawking some of his rigged soap. All right. 
forget how much of a beast this razor is. It is very aggressive. Being careful here. By 1887, he had amassed an empire. Okay? By the way, did I mention 1879? I think I did. Yeah, he arrived in Denver in 1879. His first start as a con guy happened in 1879 because Denver is where he became the most famous aside from, well, while he was alive. For living. <laughs> for stuff he did while living, I should say. All happened in Denver when he arrived there in 1879. So that's why I picked this soap. And for another reason coming later. Because you think prospect, prospect or you think gold. 1887, he had amassed an empire. He was involved with most criminal activities in Den Denver to the point that he no longer even feared the law as most of them were on the payroll. The lawyers, the lawmen. Empire. When I say he amassed an empire, he amassed an empire. To the point that lawmen were warning him of things. Or looking the other way. Because he was greasing their palms, as we would say. All right. By in 1888, Jack the Ripper's here. He opened the Tivoli Club, a saloon and gambling house that was his headquarters until 1892. Due to a crackdown on corruption that began in that year, he moved to Creed, o Col Creed Colorado, and immediately began a new empire. Okay, this is a before and after photo of the same building. And you can see right there where the Tivoli Club had been. The area is actually, considering it's been about 150 years, relatively unchanged. Isn't that pretty neat? There's a guy, and I should have put his credits, that took that photo. One sec, I'm being very careful here, because this razor will bite you. It's about as temperamental as a hyena that you're trying to hand feed. So, all right, before and after photo, he opened the Orleans Club and his brother-in-law in Creed, Colorado. Creed, Colorado, by the way, was a mining town. He opened the Orleans Club and his brother-in-law, William Cap Light, became deputy sheriff. Ain't that a daisy, as a certain someone would say. Um, he was viewed as a Robin Hood of sorts as he ran off other troublemakers, i.e. the troublemakers that would not work for him. And he actually also did look out for the townsfolk. And that is an age-old trick. Even the, the mob and the Irish mafia would do it. You know, buying turkeys for Christmas and Thanksgiving. You know, you're hurting. Here's $5. Go get yourself, you know, go buy your mom some socks, whatever. They've been doing that since time immemorial, man. Even Al Capone, for a while, was looked at as a Robin Hood figure. Mr. St. Valentine's Day Massacre himself, people really loved him. Not the people that he hurt, but a lot of people looked at him and was like, yeah, we know he's a the illegal, you know, he did some bad things, but for the most part, he was looking out for us. Um, so... Smith returned to Denver, okay, so what happened in Creed was since it was a mining town, the vein dried up, the mine dried up, the workers left, so the town just dwindled and went kaput, all right? He tried returning to Denver, but by then was too well known. And in 1897, reversed, 1897, this is why it's, uh, in my post I say 1879 and 1897 are two important years, this is why. In 1897, it was 97, the Klondike Gold Rush began, and Smith promptly moved to a town called Skagway, uh, Alaska. I almost said Arkansas. There's a wanted poster that was up in Denver, and you can see at the bottom there. Imagine showing back up, and you find a wanted poster yourself. Like, whoopsie daisy. So, he was chased away out of Skagway. This is the first time this, that I read that this happened to him. He was actually chased out of Skagway. After attempting his usual cons, he briefly moved back down. And this is no, this is before jet planes and all that. This is like by train, dude. And most of that's frontier. 
So it's not an easy feat going all the way to Alaska, which is whatever side of the video is going to show. Um, Alaska, yeah. Uh, and then moving all the way back down. So he moved to St. Louis, then Washington, D.C., of all places, before moving back in January of 1898. All right. So let me pause here. I got one page left. I've been playing with the lather a little bit. What I'm going to do, I got a couple of touch ups I need to do. Look at that lather, guys. And then I'm going to do post. But what I do want to mention is the scent. I like both tobacco blossom and tobacco leaf. I think I like tobacco leaf a bit more because it's a nice chocolatey in some cases and in some cases it's almost a, a candy like sweetness. It's always sweet. In this case, with the Tonka, it's really damn good. And the bourbon adds almost like a spicy little kick to it, if you can believe it. I call it spicy. It's almost a spicy little kick that makes it stand out. So. And the leather is very prominent in this. I think this is one of the most prominent leather soaps I have. Because as I say, I'm not a big leather guy. At all. But in this case, considering how much leather is in this, it's really well done and I like it a lot. So if you like any of those scent notes, you will like this. I cannot remember if it's discontinued. I went and Googled the soap just to double check the scent notes. And I did see like the EDP and a couple of places still selling it, like Pastures and Murphy McNeil. But, you know, if you see it, if you like this and you see it, it's possibly discontinued because I did get it at a discount. So, swoop, you know, gather, swoop it up, gather it up, whatever. Swoop in and get it. Um, let me rinse off, do post shave, be right back. All right, here we go. I love this Micromatic. She's, she's a beast though. She'll get you if you're not careful. You turn your back once, she'll nip at you. Um, I need to do a side-by-side -side with this in my 1920s Gillette ball, uh, ball handle because I the ball handle, I think, is one of the most, if not the most aggressive razor I have. I, I rarely use it, man, because I end up usually nicking myself. I might break that out again. I haven't used it in a very long time. Not very long. It's a pretty long time. But I'm happy. A little bit where I got the angle wrong. See right here when I was going sideways? You can see right there. But aside from that, not bad. Okay. So chased away. Uh, returned in January of 1898 to Skagway, Alaska. So this time, he set down roots and he started building his empire, and this time it was successful. He began paying off the deputy U.S. Marshal, of all guys, of the town, of the region, and started accumulating allies. Okay? One scam he ran, this one's interesting, a scam that he ran was a fake telegraph office now keep in mind this is alaska it's not a state yet and it is wilderness i mean there, there's bears the weather will kill you you know there's all kinds of stuff that can go wrong up there and so you're going to have a lot of telegraph offices because it's your only means to communicate with basically the outside world because you're in you're in wilderness deep okay um and then, of course, mining was extraordinarily dangerous back then. So anyway, so he, he fed on that with a telegraph office. The interesting thing about this was the wires from the telegraph went into the wall and then nowhere. It's, I don't know, the equivalent of buying like one of those fake security cameras where the wire goes in, but it doesn't go anywhere. So he would just, he would take your money, beep, 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 beep. I don't know if he'd make the noise. Actually, they didn't make noise like that. It was just a tap. I'm an idiot. The other end would beep, I think. Um, and that's Morse code, on the, which is what they used. Anyway, sorry. 
So the telegraph wire went nowhere. Okay. Uh, he charged customers for messages that were never sent. In 1898, during the Spanish-American War, Smith formed a volunteer army that was given official recognition by President William McKinley, of all people. The actual president himself gave them official recognition, and he would use this to con increase his control over the town. So, that's him. Uh, I don't think that's an actual official photo of the army, the volunteer army group, but that is some of the men that would join it, if not all of them. But you can see the mountains in the back there. This was taken in Skagway. This is some of the men. You can see that it's kind of a bigger band than was in the other photo. So by now he'd become known. And I would think up there it'd be a little easier to find some guys willing to do some shady stuff. You know, there's less law, very much uh, anarchist paradise up there. Like I said, you had the deputy, you know, U.S. Marshal and all that. But um, I think if you were to call for backup, it'd be from the Mounties, not even us, our government. My son just woke up from his nap. Almost done anyways. All right. Um, on July 7th, 1898, a man named John Stewart came to Skagway with a mine sack of gold worth then $2,700. That is $98,900 in 2023, so about $99,000 today on its way to 100 grand in gold. Again, prospector, all right? So, also, like everything fit in with the shave. That's why I use this gold razor too, along with the Jill Lett shaves guy. Uh, some of his gang convinced him to gamble his gold against a, a game of three card Monty. I don't know why the hell you would do that. I wouldn't have, I would have been like, get out of my way. After some inevitable losses, Stewart refused to pay. The men grabbed the gold, the whole bag, and ran, okay? Obviously, John Stewart had some issues with that. You know, started a huge outcry along with the townsfolk. The townsfolk went to Soapy Smith and said, hey, you should give that gold back to him. And Soapy said, no, we want it fair and square. No, you didn't. You won technically some of it. They stole it, but, you know, he decided to not pay up, so this is his not paying fee, is this whole sack of gold. God, it smells good. So, a meeting with Stewart was arranged on July 8th. It was to take place on the Juno Wharf. So, the Juno Wharf, Juno, Alaska, obviously, and then I, the only photo I could find I was afraid of using. Um, not afraid of using. I just it, you couldn't really tell it was grainy. Um, it was a drawing, but it was two long docks, and at the end of these long docks, it just opened up, and there was like a boathouse on each one. But it was this very narrow dock, like the only way to get. If there were people in your way, you'd have to like jump off and swim around them, and that ain't gonna happen. So you need to know that. Um, after arriving, he was carrying a Winchester rifle over his shoulder. He wasn't supposed to come armed. It was supposed to be a peaceful meeting to basically sort this out. He got into an argument um, with one of the four guards. There were four men blocking his path to go down this narrow little dock. And he got into an argument with one of them. And there you go. The guard's name was Frank H. Reed. And he killed Smith instantly with a shot to the heart. He shot him about three or four times, but the got, one that got him was a shot directly to the heart. Reed himself would pass away 12 days later from two bullet wounds, one to the leg, one to the groin. All right, so they mortally wounded one another. There's a photo of Mr. Smith lying on his deathbed. All right, um, I know it's kind of pushing the boundaries of whether I should say viewer discretion, but um, he looks like he's sleeping. I didn't think it was too violent. They had an autopsy photo of him. Not violent, but it was enough that it said under it, his autopsy. And I was like, I'm not showing that. Nothing bad. It wasn't gruesome at all. But it, just because it said, and then you look at it, and you're like, oh. So, anyway. Um, Soapy Smith was buried some distance away from the Skagway Cemetery. And there's a photo of his grave. 
I would imagine that that was done on purpose. Like he's not being buried here with the rest of our people after feeding off of them. But there you go. All right. Oh, good stuff. I hope y'all enjoyed that one. That was a lot of fun. 30 minutes. I'm glad I lathered off camera. Um, if you see this, pick it up. It smells delightful. Uh, very good for autumn, which is right around the corner. So I'm probably going to be breaking this out for that. I'll for a nice chilly crisp day. That'd be wonderful for that. Completely forgot about the coffee of the day, too. Uh, coffee of the day. It was this company called Atomic Coffee Roasters. Interesting thing about this. I love how they break it down here. It's like a soap. Look at that cedar. This is beans. And I don't know if I get cedar. I'm looking for it. I'm probably getting it. I just don't know it. But it's a wonderful coffee. It says medium, but it's pretty heavily roasted, in my opinion. Smoky. Mm. Really good stuff. But that will do it, everybody. I hope you all like that one. Thank you again, Dustin. Really appreciate you reminding me about that. Requesting that for me. Um, till next time I know it's been a long time I would like to do another one in the near future that is my plan I just don't know when um, I have a busy week coming my wife's busy it's just you know the way it is we got school coming up soon too so once the kids are back in school it'll be a lot easier for me I'll miss them but it'll keep me distracted um, and that'll be it thank you everyone really appreciate it thanks for watching especially if you made it to the end really appreciate that and that'll do it all right. Be careful. Be safe. Take care of one another. Have a great rest of the summer, everyone. And uh, most of all, enjoy those shaves. Happy shaving. See you next time.